Welcome, geeks, to another exciting episode of Rock of the Cold World with Donette Dave and David McCarter. I'm glad you're here. Uh, we had two weeks off, so I hope you were having some fun uh, the last two weeks um, and uh, staying uh, away from all the crappy weather, at least in America, we've been having. Uh, and it seems like we're going to have some more storms hitting in San Diego uh, in a couple days, which means it's going to hit the rest of the country. Uh, a day or two after that. So uh, buckle up. <laughs> I'm over this weather, I'll tell you that. Um, so I have an exciting show lined up for today. Uh, lots of stuff to do, uh, talk about. Um, and uh, so my guest today for the first time is uh, Milan uh, Jovanovic. He's from uh, um, Serbia. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to him because he just became a Microsoft MVP. You all know I've been an MVP for almost 18 years now, so I'm excited to talk to somebody who's just become one. Um, and he's got some other cool things uh, I want to talk about with him. So it's going to be a great show. I hope you uh, will stick at, stick around. It looks like he already has a fan uh, in the chat room. And uh, I, I always forget to tell you all to do this, but make sure you ask questions uh, so we can answer them during the show. Uh, that's what we're here for. That's why we do it live. Otherwise, I would just record it and, and we wouldn't have to have any questions. <laughs> All right. So uh, guess what I was doing last night, everybody? I was doing one of my favorite things of all time. Um, and this, I was doing photography at this concert last night. Um, I'm sorry if my mouth is now moving slowly because of the video. Uh, but this is one of my favorite groups, uh, Queensryche. Uh, I've been doing photography for them for at least 10 or 15 years now, I guess. And um, uh, it's it's literally one of my favorite things to do. But uh, uh, but I injured my foot in the process of taking those pictures. And so I'm a little bit under the weather today. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to show you this because, you know, uh, there's more to life. You know, there's more to life than... Uh, um, coding right and and that's one of the things i do to keep myself uh, keep the creativity in myself going and uh doing a picture so if you follow my uh personal website uh, i'll have the pictures up there uh, and the videos up there in a couple days uh also wanted to let everybody know about uh, my latest book uh, uh rock your code code and app performance for microsoft.net um I hope you go pick up a copy. There's a lot of great information in it. And I learned a lot from this book. So if I learned a lot from this book, I'm sure that you will learn a lot for this book too, uh, from this book. And I'm continuously, you know, working on performance uh, articles and things like that. And so make sure you check out my website or csharpcorner.com uh, to see the latest stuff I'm writing. Uh, I, this week, I've been writing a couple articles. I'm going to write one today or, or tomorrow. I'm not sure when. So uh, I hope you check back. Uh, so those articles, of course, are to supplement the book because the book was uh, released in January 1st. All right, news. Big news, everybody. The Code Quality Conference is coming back this year on June 2nd. I'm so excited. It's the biggest uh, one-day conference on the C-Sharp Corner platform. And I'm so excited to bring it back to you all. And, uh, and because, you know, this conference is it's basically because I don't see these kind of talks at conferences, right? And so this conference is to make up for that. I wish there were more code quality uh, talks at conferences. I continuously look at uh, conferences and there's not that many, uh, maybe a few, but uh, the code quality conference will be a whole day of uh, experts from around the world um, that will show the latest, greatest code quality and performance uh, 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 things for you all. <laughs> and um, so I'm really excited. So June 2nd, um, if you want to speak at the conference, please uh, sign up now. Um, make sure you have a good uh, you know, description of what you want to talk about so I can pick the, pick, uh, the ones who will work better on uh, for the conference. Because uh, we only have one day. We can't you know, it's I, some people won't be picked, unfortunately. But uh, but so send your uh, papers now or think about it now, because I'll keep bugging you until 
um, we start picking the speakers. So, and then on June 2nd, of course, make sure you uh, carve that day out to uh, watch the conference live so you can ask questions and things like that. But of course, it'll be on uh, video a uh, few days after that. So, all right. All right, I wanna announce, um, I just made it public this week, my Spargen dev tool. I'm really excited. I finally got the, the first version of this done. I have uh, lots of ideas and lots of new features. Um, and it's my first uh, global tool that I've written in, my, in Microsoft.net. So that was an interesting process, uh, doing a console app you know, with colors and all those kind of things. Uh, I was working on a video to show you what it does, but I, I didn't get it done. Um, but I'll tell you what it does right now. Um, and first, it cleans temporary and cache files from Visual Studio, SQL Server, and, and other programs that they just leave on your system for I don't know what reason. You know that some programs aren't that great at, at cleaning up after themselves. Visual Studio and .NET is definitely one of those programs. And to prove that, you can read you can read the the post. But uh, you know, uh, if, if you're coding and all of a sudden your code just doesn't work anymore, your your unit tests don't work anymore, and you go, why did they just stop working? It's probably that. And uh, and if you run a Spargen clean, it'll clean out all that stuff and get back to work really quickly. It, it deletes like almost two thousand files a second, and. Uh, and anyway, so that's the first thing it does uh, because I need that every day, pretty much. I run into issues, not only on my work computer, but on this computer too. And so I use this uh, tool every day. The other really big thing it does is it quickly backs up all your source code. And I wrote this feature because uh, you know, a couple of years ago, because I've yet to find a source control program that doesn't blow away my code. <laughs> And, you know, when you're working on some code for a day or so and it it gets destroyed by, uh, you know, a, a source a code a repository, uh, you kick yourself in the in the head and go, oh, my, I have to write all that again. <laughs> Luckily, it's it's usually faster to write it the second time, but still you've wasted a lot of time. So what uh, what the backup uh uh, feature does is it it automatically scans all of your hard drives for source code and then asks you if you want those backed up. If you say yes, then it will back all those up. Um, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of source code on my um, system. And so I also have a turbo mode, which it only backs up the changed files. Uh, so uh, it's I use it before at the end of every day. And I also use it before I touch uh, GitHub or anything like that, because I don't want to lose any source. Uh, and 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 this tool has allowed me to bring back source that, you know, some uh, GitHub or somebody's uh, destroyed on me. So I hope you go check it out. Um, I didn't get a lot of testers. So uh, forgive me if you see an error or two. If you do, uh, please email me. I'll work on it as fast as possible. Uh, but uh, I hope you check it out. And I plan to add a lot of features. And if you have ideas, uh, features you want written into it, uh, please let me know. I'm more than happy to put it in because this is for you guys. It's free tool and it's for you to help you in the development. All right. I want to bring on that Milan has worked in the industry for almost six years and progressed to a, seniors, uh, a senior engineer and software architect roles in that time frame. He specializes in web application development and works primarily with the .NET stack. He's, all, he's a big enthusiast of domain-driven design and shares his knowledge daily on various uh, social media profiles and his, in his newsletter. Uh, welcome. Hi, David. Thank you for the introduction. It's very nice to be here. Yeah, it's good. I'm, I'm glad you're here. And I want to tell everybody, you know, uh, you and I were talking about this a little bit before the show, but... You know, uh, as the show host, you know, it's it, it's my job to find uh, people to be on the show and, um, and which is kind of uh, difficult to do sometimes. Um, and and one of the ways I find people is somehow I start following them on Twitter. And if I see their tweets and I like their articles and videos, I go, hey, you want to be on the show? And so this is proof. This is how I get speakers is by that. So. Milan and I have never met, you know, we've never worked together with this first time we talked together today. 
and it's because I found them on Twitter. So start posting some interesting articles and I'll invite you. <laughs> yes, this is entirely true. I've yeah. actually been following you on Twitter for some time. I enjoy mm. uh, your polls about performance. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I also get surprised by the answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm always trying to find, uh, you know, uh, things that people haven't thought of. And uh, actually this week I tested something. I don't want to give, I, I, I want to wait for the article, but I actually found uh, something that, uh, that actually speeds up creating collections I've never seen before. So uh, uh, it's not a huge increase, but, you know, when you're, trying to shave off, you know, milliseconds, it really helps out, especially if you're doing, you know, uh, thousands of transactions per second and things like that, you know, that, that money really adds up quick. So, um, so I'll be sharing that soon. Um, I'm, I'll write that in a couple more articles, uh, but yeah, it's, and, and you specialize in, in web development and, and you say, yeah. So I, I mostly build uh, web APIs. Mm. So RESTful web APIs, mm. uh, some GraphQL stuff. Um, I also do a little bit of front-end work. I used to do uh, MVC back in the day um, and some Angular, but mm -hmm. kind of back-end APIs is, is where I feel at home. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, before I forget again, everybody, if you have questions, please post them in the chat and we'll get to them as fast as we can. Um, but you know, one of the things I kind of wanted to talk to you about first, and I kind of alluded to this at the beginning of the show is you just became an MVP, right? Yes. And so what's your, uh, area of expertise in, in the, in the program? So, uh, I became an MVP in developer technologies, mm, yeah, me too. mainly because I talk about a lot of .NET stuff, uh, yeah. on LinkedIn, Twitter, and recently on YouTube also. Hmm. And kind of all that work uh, <laughs> paid off. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I know a lot of people that watch the show are interested to be uh, an MVP. Actually, my producer wants to be an MVP. And uh, uh, so uh, how did you become one? Can you share that quickly? So I kind of started creating content online, educational content, uh, I would say some two years ago mm -hmm. to, to the date. And um, I kind of didn't know where I was going to take it. And I also learned about the MVP program. And I thought, hey, this is cool. It's a nice recognition. And it's also a nice way to kind of um, something to be motivated by. So I kind of you know, knew about the program, uh, but I didn't take it seriously. <laughs> uh, I would say until maybe late 2021. And that's when I started getting some traction on LinkedIn, uh, getting some followers, which motivated me to keep on even more sharing content. Um, and at that point, I thought, hey, what does it take to become a Microsoft MVP? Mm -hmm. So I started researching. Uh, I started connecting with a few MVPs on LinkedIn, uh, asking them some questions. Um, and you'll find that most of them are very um, friendly and Yes. We'll reply to you and yeah. help you out. Mm, the most help were a few people from Serbia, mm -hmm. which is where I live. Uh, they're not in developer technologies as I am, but they were very helpful in, in terms of what you need to do and what's expected to become an MVP. So one thing is uh, sharing useful content on social media. Mm -hmm. uh, and they also told me it would be very helpful if you had a blog. Mm -hmm. and possibly a YouTube channel. So those are kind of some of the, the ways that you can contribute. Also, there's uh, open source contributions. Uh, maybe you build a library or you contribute to some open source library. So I kind of started working uh, in that direction. Mm -hmm. And everything kind of started falling into place uh, last summer. So that would be around July. Uh, that's when I decided that I was going to start my YouTube channel mm -hmm. and kind of things went on from there. And then in August, I started my YouTube channel. And in September, I started my newsletter, which I also turned into a blog. Mm -hmm. So just today, I released uh, my latest newsletter. That, would, that was the uh, 29th issue. 
So that's already looking like a decent blog, like there's various topics. Mm, and then, so contributions to the community is one thing, mm -hmm. but you also have to make it known that you actually want to be an MVP mm -hmm. because to become an MVP, uh, somebody who is already an MVP or someone working in Microsoft has to nominate you for the award. Right. So a friend of mine uh, working in Microsoft in Belgrade, um, he helped me out, uh, nominated me, I believe it was last November, something like that. Hmm. And then it was a few months of waiting. And uh, I believe it was 1st of March when I received my award. Yeah, yeah, that was the 1st of March. I was really happy for you when you when you got that. I, I, I also was nominated by somebody at Microsoft. Um, actually, they didn't even tell me they were doing it <laughs> before. I heard about it, but uh, but yeah, I got nominated by Microsoft. So, you know, everybody who's listening and you're wondering how to be an MVP, that's basically it, right? It's not only, you know, it, we don't have time to talk about it, but, you know, it's it's kind of a grueling, I don't know what you went through, but it's kind of a grueling process to, to uh, prove to Microsoft you know what you're talking about, right? So that's one piece of it. The other piece is community, right? And, and I'm glad you brought that out because that's really what, you know, I've been doing this almost 18 years now, and that's what Microsoft is really looking for is people who participate in the community somehow, whether that's, and you don't have to be a speaker. You don't even have to be a blogger. You could just participate in, in uh, you know, uh, chat uh, rooms or whatever, you know, it it's just helping others basically. That's what the MVP program is. Besides being an expert, is you help the community, right? And um, and and that's 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 what it is. And then you have to convince somebody to nominate you. And uh, um, that, that's usually the easy the easier part. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's 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 doing all that pre work, right? Uh, that uh, beforehand. That yeah, yeah. That's and uh, and and that's it. So those of you, you know, if you want to become a Microsoft MVP. Now you know how to do it. Start blogging, start writing, start helping people, start speaking if you want. You know, uh, you know, one of the things that helped me get in it, my MVP is I ran a user group here for 20 years. I founded and ran a user group. And that was one of the things that, you know, helped Microsoft award me an MVP because I was doing that. I don't do that anymore. But, you know, when I was awarded, that's what it, what I was doing. So uh, along with writing and, and everything else, you guys see me do so yeah it's um i are have you signed up for the summit uh yes hmm. but i'll i'll be there uh, virtually oh you're not coming in person no no it's too short notice for me um, yeah. i also have a trip to to norway um, i'm speaking at a net user group there hmm. so kind of it's conflicting with each other yeah yeah that's that you know um the MVP, one of my favorite parts of the MVP, uh, MVP. So it, if you guys don't know what we're talking about, so uh, part of the MVP program, which they haven't really done since COVID, is we all go to Seattle once a year for about four days and we participate in a bunch of meetings we can't talk about because we're all under NDA. And, we, you know, we have fun too, you know, but one of my uh favorite parts is meeting people like you from all over the world because it's like the only time i get to see you in in real life right is at the mvp summit because microsoft pays for everything except for airfare so people from all over the world come you know come in that one week and uh, ascend on redmond washington and uh, <laughs> we spend you know most of those days at the campus um and uh it's always something i look forward to just because like I said, it's the only time I get to see my friends. And actually, you know, that's how I met Mahesh, who runs C-Sharp Corner, was at, at, at an MVP summit. And that's when he started talking to me about being part of uh, C-Sharp Corner and uh, coming uh, to India four times now, um, all because of the MVP program. I'm not sure if that would ever happen if, uh, if I wasn't there at the same time he was, because he used to be a, a regional director right which if, if you guys don't know regional director is like one is the one is a level up a, a, above an mvp right so they they represent uh an entire region of mvps and um that's really hard to get i haven't even tried um because there's not that many of them you know um i don't know how many mvps there are but i've been at the summit where there's been about 1800 of us there so 
Oh, wow. um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that many come anymore, but back when I started, definitely that that was happening back then. Um, so yeah, it's a great program. And if you guys want to do it, try, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's hard process, but it's pretty rewarding and you'll find out, you know, and, and, uh, you know, my, my favorite part of being an MVP is just, I have impact on developer technologies, right. And, and that's one of my goals is to make those products and stuff better when I go to Microsoft and, and, and talk with them. I, you know, I talk to Microsoft people all year, but, you know, being in, in front of their face uh, helps out a lot. Yeah. So uh, welcome to the program. I, I, uh, I keep it up. And oh, also, if you are haven't heard of when we get awarded, we actually get a, get awarded for the year prior. Right. Prior. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we, when you get even though even though it's states, it's for the current year. Yeah, it's your current year, but you're actually being awarded for the year prior. For what right? you did in the yeah, year prior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right so, now, so given I, that you've been like an MVP veteran for the better part of the past two decades, uh, what can I do to keep my award? Just keep doing what you're doing. You know, as long as you keep writing and and keep, you know, proving to Microsoft that people are listening to you, right? Because uh, you know, we have to report to Microsoft everything we do, you know, the videos, the books, the articles, the, you know, the shows I do and things like that. Um, we have to report all that to Microsoft because they want to see how we've been helping the community. Right. And so I'm really bad at that. You know, I have a calendar event that reminds me like every quarter to update my MVP and I never do it. And of course, tomorrow <laughs> tomorrow is the last day, and I have to scramble tomorrow to get everything in there. Uh, but so I, I'm really bad on that part. I wish it was a little more automatic, but um, but yeah, just keep doing what you're doing and and writing good articles and and having people uh, listen and 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 read your stuff. And yeah, it'll be good. Oh, and oh, don't break your NDA. <laughs> right. Microsoft is really really anal about the NDA. Um, and, uh, don't say anything bad in chat rooms and stuff, because I've seen people kicked out in the same day. They said they posted something bad, uh, like, you know, against a different race or something like that. And they were out of the program, you know, Oh, well, no uh, worries. That's, that's not yeah. who I am. No, so. no, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm just saying those, and I've seen people still, still useful information. Yeah. Know. And I've seen people kicked out of the MVP summit because they broke the NDA while they're there. <laughs> so somebody tweeted something they weren't supposed to, and they were out, gone. Okay, that so, seems harsh, but... No, they, the, the rules Microsoft, the rules. Microsoft, like I said, Microsoft is very anal about their NDA. So when you're at this summit, do not tweet about anything you learn about and don't post any pictures, <laughs> right? That's my biggest advice when you're at the summit is don't say anything. Say you're there. Say you're having fun, but don't say what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, they're, I think they're a little better than they used to be, but um, uh, there were some years where they were really bad. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you know they 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 uh, uh, they kicked you out right away. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, let's get to those before we go on to the next subject. Uh, uh, one person asks, uh, what was the first one? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. What are the alternative options to rest? So in my eyes, there, there's no alternative, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. But, uh, I mean, you can try out some other options, uh, but you're going to go through a lot of pain. Yeah. So one option is uh, SOAP. Mm -hmm. which is based on XML and That's it's the old uh, way, kind of right? the old way of doing things. I, I don't think anybody does it uh, these nah. days except in legacy systems. Yeah. Um, the other cool way is using GraphQL, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I believe was popularized by uh, Facebook or Meta. Um, mm -hmm. I could be mistaken, of course. Um, it's, it's a nice idea, but uh, the implementation to implement something like that in .NET uh, it's a, it's a wild ride. No, yeah. there's also uh, a GRPC. 
gRPC. Oh, you... Yeah. Okay. There's gRPC. There's binary. You know, you can do binary, but most people do REST. You know, and and uh, yeah, for good it, reason. Yeah, the REST. You know, uh, I mean, there's also you know, there's also improvement for REST, but I you know, I've been using REST ever since uh, I think 2008, I think, and um, and uh, and I've never looked back because, you know, the one of the biggest, one of the things I really like about REST is that, you know, the, the people can request just the data they need, not everything, right? And they can kind of create their own queries too, right? And so that, as a, as an API developer, you know, that, that alleviates a lot of work for us because we don't have to create an endpoint for everything they want to do, right? We we just provide the data and then they query the data the way the way they want to query the data, right? And so, you know, speaking about performance, you know, I say this all the time, you know, when I'm speaking or whatever, is that you know the biggest performance problem you're ever going to have is the internet, right? Mm -hmm. That's the biggest problem, right? You can optimize the front end and the back end all you want, but if you don't worry about the, the middle part, you know, the internet part. Uh, yep. you know, you're, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot, you know, and I learned this a long time ago and, and that's, you'd need to worry about all of it, but you have to worry about that too. So one of the ways to do that is number one, right? Don't crawl, go across the wire unless you have to, right? And number two, um, make that data as small as possible, right? Because mm -hmm. that allows more people to hit your servers and things like that, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, it, so I mean that was an interesting question. Yeah, um, I'd like to like kind of attack it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. um, not what are the alternatives to REST, but when would you want to consider not using REST? Like that's yeah. interesting. Um, I can't see too many arguments for that, but maybe I'm biased to be honest. Yeah. The, I think the only argument is some people don't like using HTTP within the company, within the domain, right? So if you have one server talking to another server, you know, uh, HTTP is, you know, not always the best transport mechanism. There's other mechanisms you can use, right? Uh, HTTP is not the fastest, really, if you want to go within the same domain, right? Within the same server farm or whatever. So I think that's part of why some people don't like it is because of that but externally it's the way to go mm -hmm. yeah yeah um but after what i've been seeing on the news lately our jobs are going to be over soon anyway with chat gpt or whatever it's called and <laughs> I, i'm still uh skeptical yeah, me too but uh, uh that's just my stance well you know I what know. I, I i mean i i love the technology uh i've been using it i'd say almost daily since uh, december mm -hmm. uh, i really like it for um, getting content ideas uh, maybe getting some outline for a post on some topic it's very useful for that mm -hmm. mm, but for coding i don't like it because i've tried it a few times and it sometimes it, it spits out okay code right. but it has a tendency to uh, make things up yeah so I had um, uh, I had a situation with uh, EF Core and uh, the PostgreSQL uh, provider. I, I was trying to do something with uh, full text search uh, to set up an index and so on. And I was like, okay, let's ask uh, ChatGPT uh, hmm. what it thinks. Hmm. And it, it came up with some nice uh, solution, how I can configure the index and everything. And I was blown away. I like, this is amazing. Look at mm -hmm. this. I've never seen this uh, this function before. Uh, let me go to my code and try it out. And lo and behold, it doesn't exist. <laughs> it doesn't <work. laughs> so, I mean, it picks up, you know, things. Oh, a made up function names it called? Yes. yes. Uh. <laughs> so, But I'm telling you, it looked so believable. I was 100% convinced. Okay, this is the solution to my problem. I'll plug this in and be on my way. And yeah. uh, I even researched the, the documentation for the mpg sql provider and uh, it does not exist mm -hmm. so i was uh you know you should be careful with uh, with chat gpt yeah yeah <laughs> I, uh um i i was going to say 
I, you know, I used to teach at the university here and, uh, well, one of the universities here. And, uh, I was thinking all your teach, all the teachers out there, make sure you run the code before you grade it because <laughs> students are going to start to use that. <laughs> I had two students, uh, try to cheat my class and, uh, Mm -hmm. Now, um, so yeah, I can see where, it, but you know what? So one of the articles I'm writing right now is about uh, the regular expressions and, you know, regular expressions, uh, you know, if you guys haven't used them, it's one of the things that we use that no one likes using because no one can remember the freaking syntax for it, you know, because it's so convoluted and weird. And so, you know, my, my personal problem, you know, uh, uh, using regex is I, I, it's hard for me to come up with those patterns unless I steal it from somebody else. And so I, I did see someone talk about or a photo or something about uh, someone's writing regex expressions with chat GPT. And I was going, OK, now I want to use it. <laughs> so did it I, work? I, I, I didn't see the whole thing. I was I was probably doing something else. I was probably mm. working or something, but. I, I got to look it up, but I go, go. Yeah, yeah, that re works. Re regex is something you don't try to to memorize. Like, no, 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 it, no one knows it really, and uh, uh, <laughs> even the people that, that no, I say they do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Let's see, we have some more questions. So, um, uh, somebody says they're developing e-commerce applications in Blazor. Uh, what did oh? Uh, Somebody, oh, oh, yeah. Which one is best, uh, server or web assembly? Which one do you think? So, I tried out Blazor first, I believe, back when it was in preview. That mm -hmm. was like uh, five, six years ago. Yeah, uh, I, I was still, I, I was still in in college, um, and I really liked the idea behind Blazor of being able to build UI applications uh, using C Sharp. Now, as far as which one is best, um, I don't think any one of them is best because mm. they both have their, their shortcomings. So with WebAssembly, uh, I'd say the biggest problem is the, the download size. Yeah. Um, so it's just a very large applications compared to something like React, uh, a simple uh, JavaScript application with HTML uh, that's going to be in the kilobytes range, whereas the WebAssembly is still in the megabytes. Yeah. Um, I honestly have not been following it recently. So I'm sure they made improvements, but I don't think it's still on the level of uh, JS or TypeScript libraries. Um, so that's the one issue. Um, and with Blazor server, uh, the problem is you're, you're forced to run WebSocket connections to the backend um, to, to get real-time updates. So yeah. any, anything changes on the UI, that's a round trip to the server. Yeah. Um, and then how much can you scale that and so on so i'd say uh, both options are limited um but if you want a real ui application probably web assembly is what you want to do but then you have to be careful with uh the the problem with download size yeah yeah that's that's definitely true but they both have their their advantages too like you know web assembly you know, has more access to the local system, right? And uh, uh, Web WebAssembly can also work offline, you know, which mm -hmm. is, you know, something that, you know, not hardly anything, any web application can do off can do offline, right? And so WebAssembly can actually do offline too. Um, so yeah, they both have their advantages. You know, uh, I, I think it was last year, Simon, uh, that uh, we had the uh, creator of Octane on, and um, and that's all built around uh, Blazor. And Octane is, and, and if you guys want to use Blazor, um, I would definitely look at Octane because it 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 basically, uh, get, you know, it does all the heavy plumbing stuff, you know, that we all have to do with our websites. Uh, it does for you. It's just all configurable, and you create these little widgets, and you add them to your website, and boom, they work. Right. So uh, I was playing around with it last year because I was uh, working with Mahesh uh, uh, with something else uh, for a project of his. And, uh, and so if you're new to Blazor, you should check out Octane. It'll get you there faster. That's for sure. Um, 
and the way they've architected it is pretty cool. I, I like it, uh, the way it updates and everything. So, um, so what, uh, so that, that was a, that was a good answer. So what database do you typically choose for when you're designing systems, if you have a choice? Oh, so, so my favorite has for the longest time. I mean, I'm a, first of all, I'm a, a relational kind of guy. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> SQL databases are something I'm most familiar with, um, yeah. something I can efficiently design a data model around. So that's kind of my uh, default choice. Now, when it comes to the specific database, uh, what I've been using in kind of the first half of, of my professional career was a SQL Server mm -hmm. uh, from Microsoft, uh, simply because I still believe it's the most popular library, yeah. uh, sorry, database in, in .NET. Mm -hmm. um, and then recently I switched to Postgres. Mm -hmm. And I personally like it more. Uh, because it's open source, it's free and so on. So there's yeah. there's like the, the cost savings um, cons to take into consideration. And also, I mean, Postgres is an object relational database. So you have a little bit more flexibility in mm. how you can design your data model. So that's why I like it personally. Yeah. So, but you can't kind of like only limit yourself to that when mm. choosing a database. No. Um, you need to take... Uh, many things into account. Is your data structured? Is it unstructured? Uh, what kind of access patterns are you, is it? Is your application supposed to support and so on? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I've been using SQL Server ever since I've been programming, you know, pretty much, I think. And, and uh, so I've, you know, I've designed entire database systems for companies, you know, in the past. And, uh, and I've written about that. And, uh, um, but these days, you know, especially because of all the features, I I haven't unfortunately spent enough time getting into this because I can't find a company who uses it. But uh, you know, I'm really interested in you know document-based databases like Cosmos DB uh, because of the flexibility, you know, how easy they are to globally, you know, uh, uh, put your data in in any data region you want, and it automatically you know keeps in sync and. And so a lot of things that SQL Server can't really do, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Cosmos DB definitely does. And and so for that flexibility, you know, I I personally like that. I'm you know I'm going to be adding that re-adding that back to my global tool because it was in the. So my global tool, this is the third version. It first it was a console app, then it was a Windows app, and now I've changed it back into a a console app, basically a global tool. And so. Um, I'll be uh, getting back into my Azure Cosmos DB stuff for that app. Uh, and, and it has a lot of advantages, a lot of disadvantages too, right? And especially the learning curve. Uh, but I think those kind of databases will be, you know, what we'll be dealing with more in the future, you know? Yeah. Um, I like relational databases. I always will, but, you know, I, I kind of personally see this as, a, as the feature of, of a lot of the data stores we're going to be using. And I'm sure 20 years from now, it'll become something completely different, right? But uh, that's what I'm seeing for the near future, at least. Or we'll still be using SQL. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's cheaper. You know, if you guys want to save costs, you know, especially in the cloud, SQL Server is a hell of a heck of a lot cheaper than the Cosmos DB. That's for sure. Cosmos DB is not cheap. So uh, uh, SQL Server is the way to go if you're trying to save costs for sure. Um, uh, I think your friend asked this. I like this one. Uh, how much time do you spend daily on tech stuff like uh, uh, office works, blog writing, YouTube, things like that? So, I mean, uh, now that it's my job, <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of spend uh, all all day on it mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I not because I have to, because I enjoy it a lot. Um, but I've been asked ab about this uh, quite a lot. So kind of I have some rough numbers in my head if you're interested mm -hmm. um so writing i write uh, one newsletter or blog a week and that usually takes me around two to three hours mm -hmm. so that's um, uh, coming up with a topic then writing an article and then i write it in markdown uh, or mdx actually um on my on my website and then i have to convert that into the 
uh, email version. So I do double the work because I don't know, I didn't think of a way to optimize that yet. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just a few hours. And then for the YouTube stuff, I'd also I'd say take, I do uh, two videos a week. Um, and it takes me, I don't know, let's say around two and a half, three hours per video. Yeah. yeah. So recording, editing, uh, coming up with a thumbnail and so on. So, but I'd say I'm relatively good at it now. I wasn't mm -hmm. as good at it when I started. Mm -hmm. um, and then just for research, uh, I do that all the, all day, pretty much. Um, I'm constantly on LinkedIn, on Twitter. Uh, there's always people talking about stuff. Um, I also like to, to read. You can see the big bookshelf uh, mm -hmm. behind me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, you have a lava lamp. All right. Yeah, I, I just started working. <laughs> I've been meaning to get one back. You know, back, uh, you know, back in the '90s, early 2000s, I always kept one on my desk because it helped me relax. You know, whenever I felt stress, I would just look at that for a little while, and it, it kind of relaxes me. And I, I kind of need to get one again. Actually, I should put it right here in, in between my two monitors. That's a good idea. I haven't thought about that. I, I added it to to bring some life to yeah, my yeah. to my background. Right. That's the throw the lava lamps uh, for you young people out there are a throwback from like the 60s and 70s. Uh, that's when they were first pretty popular, I think. Um, uh, oh, this is a good question. Uh, I'm uh, I'm using in local I'm using local storage. How can I assist for security things before calling the API? So I guess security on local storage. Do you have any suggestions on that? So I'm not too kind of proficient with security in the browser. Yeah. Um, are you talking so, about so, security for like a, a Blazor application, local storage, or like a like a? Well, Windows I mean, I guess that, no, that would asking, apply. I'm, I'm asking the person who asked it. That's like, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I mean, I'm guessing local storage is okay. probably the browser local storage so it would apply for any client side application um i'm not really sure to be honest yeah um you could i mean you could use something like you know microsoft used to have a local storage database i forget what it was called uh, I'd have to look at one of my slides because it's actually on my architecture slide. Um, it oh, it was called SQLite or something like that that you can use for local storage. And so, if you're using something like, if I'm remembering correctly, like SQLite, then you have the same kind of security, you know, passwords and everything to get into it. So that would secure it to me, right? Um, or you could write your own and just encrypt it all, but that would be kind of costly for performance, right? Yeah, I would just use a local database store, to tell you the truth, because then you have the same database capabilities. And and, and the SQLite is not, a, a, or even SQL Server Express is not like the full-blown thing. It's just enough to like query data and put data in it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, Microsoft used to have a technology that allowed us to do that pretty easily, but they abandoned it a long time ago, unfortunately. Um, but... But yeah, I, I would say that's that's my answer um, is to use something like that. Did anybody else have a have a suggestion on what to use for a, local, a secure local data store? You know, I've I've had the uh, a project manager for uh, uh, Cosmos DB on my show a couple of times, and I, and I've asked them this uh, seriously. I said, you know, when are you going to come out with a Cosmos DB for local, right? Oh, and. and? He goes, oh. <laughs> it's not, they're not even thinking about something like that. But, but, but that's basically why I asked him that question is for a local data store, right? And, uh, and that would be a great data store because it's just a bunch of JSON documents, right? The, <laughs> it's nothing super sophisticated. And uh, that would be great. I wish somebody would, you know, do like a Cosmos DB local, right? Um, maybe they will if, if enough of us complain about it. So email Microsoft everybody right so now. Do, do you think we need that um, for like a local development environment? 
or just no, being no, able to run it uh, off the cloud yeah off the cloud right yeah, right yeah. whether you have whether your application is blazor or a, a windows app or you know something on the mac or something right we need mm -hmm. a local data store that's really easy to use and we don't really have one right now except for maybe sqlite or C sql server express right that's basically all we have right now um as far as i'm i'm aware unless somebody else knows but uh yeah so yeah i do want a cosmos db light a uh, light right you know i don't need all the features i just need something to stick data in and get data out of really easily right and so yeah um any more questions before we wrap up in in 10 minutes or so oh uh what database are you using when you're using CraftQL? So I don't have any production experience with no, GraphQL. Yeah. Um, I've consumed GraphQL APIs, um, but that's an entirely different thing. So I don't yeah. think I can answer this. Um, yeah, let me add that to my yeah. kind of uh, learning list and then I'll talk I... about it on on my channels. Yeah, I just made a note. I'm going to contact Microsoft next week and see if they can send me a, a somebody for my show who knows a lot about GraphQL because because I want to yeah, learn more about GraphQL. Yeah, it already GraphQL popped up too. a few times, so people are interested. Yeah, yeah, I'm interested too. I just haven't had time, or you know, we don't do it at work, and so I, I haven't had the time to really uh, uh, learn about it too much. But it looks really cool. Um, I forget. <sighs> Oh, there's another technology I want to learn, and I contacted Scott Hunter, you know, at Microsoft, and he sent me a list. I'm so I'm going to have that person on the show uh, in a couple months, I hope. But but now I forgot what I wanted to learn. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh, do you use navigation properties for joined? Uh, yeah, do you use navigation properties for joins with querying data on your aggregates? Okay. I'm not sure what you mean by navigation properties. Is that so, an any framework thing? Yes, yes, and that's yeah, an yeah. EF, EF, uh, any framework thing. Um, I guess, yes. Um, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, let me just think about it. Oh, I remember um, what they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I most certainly do use navigations for joins. Yeah. Uh, I think that's perfectly fine uh, why would you fight against ef core in general yeah yeah, yeah. i i've been using the ef uh, any framework ever since before when it was in beta right and 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 in my personal projects uh that's all i use right ever since any framework came out i go heck this is so easy you know and uh Ooh, so now i have a spicy question for you mm. uh what do you think about uh, abstracting entity framework with uh, yeah, repository you, interfaces. So I posted a question on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Too. And like it really blew up. Uh, a lot of people started uh, adding comments. So I'm curious what you think. Are, are you talking ab abstracting the database context away from the other parts of any framework? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's exactly the way I've been doing it since the beginning. And in the beginning, you couldn't really even do that, right? Mm -hmm. I did it by brute force, because <laughs> before code first, doing that was really, really difficult. And I think I was the only person who knew how to do it or did it, right? Uh, but yes, I always do that. You know, when I when I talk about architecture, you never put your data models with the with the database context, right? And so so I I'll give my reasons why 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 wouldn't you want to put them all together? So uh, th this mostly comes from um, uh, clean architecture, this entire debate. Mm. So uh, let's just give a brief overview of the clean architecture. Uh, you can think of it as uh, a few concentric circles. Uh, so in the center, you have your domain, which contains all of your entities and your, your domain logic. And then on top of that, you have your application layer, which is supposed to orchestrate your use cases uh, and interact with your domain. Mm -hmm. And then in the outermost layers, you have things like persistence, which is where EF core should live. So the, the debate usually comes from uh, 
the application layer is not supposed to have any external concerns, one of them being the database. Right. And what people would do is, me being one of them, uh, is create interfaces for various repositories and uh, the unit of work, and then use that interface in the application layer. And then in the in in the implementation, you would use uh, EF Core. Yeah. And so the argument is, okay, it's easier to test when you have interfaces, you can mock mm -hmm. them, but the counter argument is, uh, why would you want to mock your database, just run an integration test? <laughs> um, then the other argument people usually say is, okay, but with a repository, I can easily switch my database. Mm -hmm. um, but when do you actually do that? Uh, so I've not been coding for that long professionally, mm -hmm. just six years, but I've never had to switch a database. I have. Sure. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, you yeah. obviously have been, but how many times? Once, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's yeah. once in, yeah. I assume, what is a very long career. Long time. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's an, I'd say switching the database is an exception. Yeah. Uh, and not something that that you should kind of plan for. Hmm. So, I mean, it comes down to the, the Yagni principle. You ain't going to need it. Um, <laughs> so, so I'm kind of, Switching from, um, me personally, I've been kind of migrating from complicating things to making them as simple as possible. Yes. So Keeping it simple, stupid, right? Yes. So yeah. <laughs> why not simply use EF Core directly? Right. Yeah. And, and, and my answer to that and why I've been doing it since 2008, basically, is, is, the way I look at it is developing applications is that, you know, when you put your models in the context all in one DLL, that means any layer, any other part of your program that needs those models will also have to carry along with the context which you necessarily don't want, right? Including right. the client side, right? right so right. unless you want to duplicate your models everywhere, the best, the way that I, that I even taught my students at the university was, you know, you should have one assembly. That all that's in it are models. That's it. Nothing else. No database context, no nothing. Just models, right? With the appropriate attributes and all that stuff for any framework. But that's it, right? And then you have your other uh, assembly who's just the database uh, context piece of it, right? And keep mm -hmm. that separate because... Now, if you separate your models, right, you can use those on every application layer you have, including the client side if you're .NET, right? And, you know, the benefit to that is, you know, those models are where I put all, in all the validation, right, of the yeah. data. And you guys all know that I talk a lot about encapsulation, right? And so it, though that's where your the, the validation rules should be typically not always, but usually in the models themselves, right? And so that way you get the same validation on everywhere you use those models and where you're not, might not be using the database, right? Yeah, that's the way I've always been doing it and will never stop, you know? Uh, and that's why I said I kind of had to brute force it back when, before we had uh, code uh, code first. Uh, uh, and that was not a difficult, that, that wasn't an easy process. and. Uh, uh, but I did it because of those concerns, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think we're out of questions and we're just about out of time. Um, we didn't get to talk too much about your your new title. Tell everybody what your new title is. Oh, uh, the solopreneur thing? Yeah, solopreneur. <laughs> Explain what that is really quick. So um, it's just a fancy name for somebody who is an entrepreneur and is doing kind of a one-man business. Hmm. Um, so that's something that's been uh, appealing to me. Uh, and uh, I was trying to figure out how to make that switch. And uh, it turned out that talking about .NET online is a pretty good career for a solopreneur. <laughs> so I'm excited kind of to, to be able to commit all of my time to this because I have so many ideas for 
how I can help the community even further. And kind of, I'm excited to to reveal kind of what I've been working on mm -hmm. in the coming weeks and months. Yeah, I, I wish I had your job. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what I need to do, but I need to figure out how to do it. That's one of the reasons I follow you because you that seems appealing to me. So I want to learn from you too. So um, it's the way it works in this world. We all help each other, right? Mm -hmm. All the good developers help each other. That's what you experienced with the MVP program, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, last question before we go, and it's the last question I ask all my first time guests. And so besides coding, you know, what do you do for fun? Oh, so um, I've been into sports um, most of my life. Mm. So that's something I enjoy. Um, recently, I've been doing uh, a lot of uh, cross country uh, running. Mm. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, I also enjoy uh, reading a lot. Uh, I love playing chess. Uh, my late grandfather uh, taught me how to play. Mm. And uh, my main kind of occupation with chess while I was growing up was trying to beat him. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course. And yeah. I eventually managed to do it. But uh, he, he will still give me a hard time. <laughs> of course. He's your grandfather. <laughs> you can't beat me. You're a kid. <laughs> I know. I have grandkids now, so I understand. Um, mm. Well, you know, thanks so much for being on the show. I've, I've really enjoyed you being on and may, maybe have you back on soon to talk about your new your new career path. And because uh, we didn't really get to talk about that. And um, I also want to uh, tell you that if you want any help or ideas or, you know, how, with the MVP program, please feel free to reach out and, and, and contact me. I'm more than willing to help. And, uh, and I want to ask from you, if there's any conferences in your area, let me know so I can apply because I want to go as many conferences in many different countries before I'm done with this job. Mm -hmm. So um but so and if you want to hang out after the show we can talk but it's i it, i know it's late there so um what time is it there by the way so it, it's uh close to 7 p.m yeah yeah so you have other better things to do like i'd be watching <laughs> netflix right i just got yeah, done watching going to, uh, going to unwind and uh, relax a little today yeah yeah I, last night after I came back from the concert. I, I watched the last episode of Canary Row. So if you guys haven't seen that, it's pretty cool. If you're into like sci-fi, like fantasy things, you know, it's it's really good. It, it stars Orlando Bloom and and some other actress you'd seen. I can't remember her name, so, but it's a pretty good show. Um, Could you repeat the name for me again? Yeah, it's called Canary Row. All right. Yeah, yeah, Canary uh, Row. I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah, the second season just came out. Uh, the last season will be next year, and uh, it's a pretty good show. I like it. So thanks so much. I hope I can't wait to have you back on the show again, and, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you, David, for having me. Um, I'd love to come back in mm. a few months' time uh, sure. because uh, some exciting things are going to happen in that time span, and then we'll have uh, a, lot, a lot to talk about. Sure. Just reach out to me. I'll, I'll book you on the show. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, that was a great uh, episode. All my episodes, I, I think, are great. Uh, but, I, you know, I like meeting new people and getting to know new people. And uh, it's one of my favorite things to do. And uh, and so getting to know Milan and what all he's up to, and especially since he's a new MVP, uh, is for me, it was interesting to talk to him about all that. So I hope you all found it interesting. I got a lot of questions this um, episode, so that's a good sign, I think. Uh, or maybe those are all his friends. I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, that was great. So I can't wait to have him back on the show again. So, uh, you know, we still have to think about the Ukraine, unfortunately. So um, this, this terrible thing is still going on there. And so if you can help out uh, with any way you can to help, uh, you know, uh, the people there, uh, please do so. Um, you'll, you know, you'll be a special part of my heart if you do, because you, know, you all know I... I loved uh, visiting the Ukraine. I want to go back and, and uh, we got to get this thing over and move on and, and uh, you know, do bigger, better things. I, I, I have been getting some uh, hits on my website from the Ukraine. So I, I'm hoping some people are doing programming there. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's keep them in our thoughts and, and prayers. Um, 
also uh oh i had a, a funny thing to show you but i i hit it i didn't unhide it nah, oh well i'll show you next month uh, uh, yeah next month uh so um every week i ask you all to help me help the kids in india uh by going to that url or going to voiceofslum.org you know this is a video from when i visited there last october and you all know i raise money for them and um and hopefully we'll you know work that into the code quality conference too somehow uh but please go help the kids there you know dave and chandy do an awesome there they are they do an awesome work for these kids from the orphanage uh from the slums in india so if you can go help them out uh uh then uh i i would definitely appreciate it but they of course the kids will appreciate it a lot more all right, so um, because of some scheduling things with uh, Simon, my producer, uh, the next show isn't going to be till April 15th. We're going to have Barrett Blake. He's also a Microsoft MVP and Azure Solutions Architect. So uh, that'll be a fun. So if, if you want to, if you have your Azure questions, uh, wait till April 15th. Oh, that's tax day here in America. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll get them answered for you there. Um, please be safe. Listen to your medical professionals about COVID or whatever else is going on in your area of the world. Uh, listen to your medical professionals and the scientists. Um, uh, I, you know, I was curious about COVID because, you know, they don't really talk about it on the news much uh, right now. And um, and uh, so uh, the other day when I was getting acupuncture, I asked my uh, acupuncturist, I go, are you having patients still getting COVID? And she goes, oh, yeah, within the last couple of weeks, I've had two patients out with COVID. So it's still here. So please be careful. Um, I want you to come back on the show. And uh, also, I'll be doing this tomorrow. Uh, please donate blood at your local blood bank. Um, all the blood banks are in the shortage, at least in America, and they need your help. It's it's easy. It's it's free. It doesn't cost anything but about a half hour of your time. And that one donation can help up to three people. Right. And if you're looking to lose a little weight. It one donation burns uh, 1200 calories. <laughs> you can have a really big lunch afterwards. That's what I do. I go next door to my favorite sushi place and reward myself with some sushi after I uh, spend two hours. I'd spend two hours on a machine. Uh, you only need to spend 30 minutes and uh, and help someone else because someday you're going to need that blood. So guess where that comes from? <laughs> People like me. <laughs> All right. Thanks everybody for watching the show. I'll see you in a, in a little less than a month uh, with Barrett. And uh, if you have any ideas, questions, please email, email me at rockinacoldworld.csharpcorner.com. With that, have a great rest of the weekend. See you later.